So our, our next speaker was to be Carlos Ramos, who unfortunately wasn't able to make it, but fortunately we have Cleo Rooney here to present from Baylor College of Medicine. And the title is Autologous TGF-beta resistant HPV 1618 E6 E7 specific T lymphocytes with or without lymphodepletion for the treatment of HPV associated cancers. Thanks, Cleo. So I'd like to apologize for Carlos who has called home ur urgently and I hope I can do justice to his work. So uh, these are our disclosures. So he, the oncogenic human papillomaviruses um, are associated with 100% of cervical carcinomas and uh, an increasing fraction of head and neck cancers. And the virus integrates into, into these tumors and expresses the viral proteins E6 and E7, and these provide targets for cytotoxic T cells. Uh, although the, uh, the vaccine for human papillomaviruses is, is extremely effective in preventing HPV infection, uh, it's, they're completely ineffective against uh, established carcinomas since it's the L1 proteins that are in the vaccine. So the function of T cells in, in, in these tumors is going to be inhibited by the inhibitory tumor microenvironment. And one of the most potent molecules from the microenvironment is TGF-beta, which is produced not only by tumor cells, but by infiltrating inflammatory cells. And so we, um, Carlos decided that uh, that if we could reactivate and expand endogenous HPV-specific T cells from patients, then this might be a better way of infusing, uh, of treating these patients with carcinoma. So as a source of antigen, we used uh, HPV peptides. These are overlapping peptides spanning the entire protein sequences of E6 and E7. And for most viruses, uh, and we've worked with many viruses in the center for cell and gene therapy, one can just throw the peptides onto peripheral blood mononuclear cells, and in the presence of cytokines, this will expand a population of, of virus-specific T cells. But HPV is a much more difficult virus, and the only worse virus is probably measles. Um, so to make HPV-specific T cells, Carlos had to make dendritic cells, pulse them with the HPV pet mixes, and perform two rounds of stimulation of these uh, of PBMCs so that one dendritic cell stimulation did not really produce much expansion and two, two dendritic cell stimulations were required to get a sufficient T cells to test. And so he was able to show that these uh, HPV specific T cells were able to recognize E6 and E7 and on these uh, and on these two graphs you can see an Ellie spot assay which measures the number of cells that secrete gamma interferon in response to stimulation with the E6 and E7 peptides. So you can see that, uh, that there, is specific, uh, there is a specific response to the E6 and E7 antigens. And I'd just like to point out here that the LE spot underestimates the true frequency of these T cells by 10 to 100 fold. So these uh, T cells were shown to be uh, specific for E6 and E7 and there was no response to other uh, peptides, for example, LMP1 from EBV and, uh, and Survivin. And these T cells could also be cytotoxic. And here you can see that the E7, E6 and E7 specific T cells are able to kill target cells, either T cell blasts on the left or B blasts on the right, pulsed with peptides. However, not all of these lines were cytotoxic, but even the lines that were not cytotoxic are able to secrete cytokines in response to stimulation, as you can see um, on the right panel. So in transferring this to a clinical trial, that the challenges are in, in the generation of sufficient HPV-specific T cells, which I'm calling HPV-STs, and this is partly because dendritic cell numbers are limiting. So already it's difficult to get sufficient dendritic cells for two rounds of stimulation, so we look for an alternative antigen-presenting cell. A second problem is, is as I mentioned, the TGF-beta, which is so frequently secreted by tumors. And we had worked with a dominant negative TGF-beta receptor over many years, and we've evaluated this dominant negative TGF-beta receptor in patients with lymphoma, and this strategy pro proved to be safe and promising. And the third problem was, is the ex, in vivo expansion after infusion, and we wondered about the role for lymphodepletion. 
So to expand the HPV-specific T cells, we took the HPV-specific T cells after two dendritic cell stimulations and then re-stimulated them, then transduced them with the dominant negative TGF-beta receptor and provided a third stimulation with an antigen-presenting complex which consists of autologous activated T cells pulsed with peptides. These cells upregulate co-stimulatory molecules and HLA class 1 and class 2 molecules and so can present all the HPV antigens to the T cells. An additional co-stimulation is provided by the HLA negative K562 cell line, which has been genetically modified to express CD80, CD86, CD83, and 41BB ligand. So by day 23 of T cell culture, we, we can get sufficient uh, T cell numbers to treat patients. So the clinical trial was developed to treat patients with any HPV-associated malignancies. Most of our patients were head and neck cancers or cervical cancer, and all patients were to have recurrent or refractory disease. And the high-risk HPV expression was, was uh, confirmed by in such hybridization or PCR or, or the expression of P16 by immunohistochemistry. So the primary objectives, of course, was feasibility and safety, the feasibility of making these dominant negative uh, TGF-beta receptor modified HPV-specific T cells from patients and, the, and their safety. And the secondary objectives were the survival and immune function of the HPV-specific T cells and their anti-tumor function. So this is the treatment overview. So we began with a dose escalation study using the continual reassessment study, and we infused pretty low doses, starting from a one times 10 to the 7 per meter squared, not per kilogram, per meter squared, and escalating up to 1 times 10 to the 8 per meter squared. These are low doses, but re repeat infusions uh, were permitted if we saw any type of tumor uh, response. In cohort A, because we were concerned about the dominant negative TGF-beta receptor, they received no lymphodepleting chemotherapy, but cohort B received cyclophosphamide and fludarabine as lymphodepleting therapy. And just by chance, all but one of the patients were actually ch receiving checkpoint inhibitors at the time of infusion, but all patients were progressing through the checkpoint inhibitors. So these are the patient characteristics. There were eight patients ranging in age from 38 to 64 years. Um, there were three patients who had cervical carcinoma and the others had oropharyngeal carcinoma. They had all had multiple th prior therapies and uh, the first four received no lymphodepleting chemotherapy, and the last four res did receive lymphodepleting chemotherapy, and all but patient one were receiving checkpoint inhibitors. So what I'm showing you here is patients one to four, the expansion of the, um, of the dominant negative HPV-specific T cells, and these are tracked by PCR for the, for the TGF-beta transgene, which is expressed from a retrovirus vector. <clears throat> and interestingly, the only patient who really had expansion was patient one, who's a patient who was not receiving lymphodepleting ke chemotherapy. And this is actually quite impressive expansion, considering that there was no lymphodepleting chemotherapy. And the other patients really did not expand much beyond the three-hour time point, which is the first time point shown. In patients who did receive chemotherapy, there was much better expansion. And here... In the blue line, you can see patient one, where there was very little uh, expansion, and we have obviously a very different x-axis. But in the patients who received lymphodepleting chemotherapy, you can see that there is far greater expansion, although the maximum expansion was about two weeks, and then after the, the patient starts to uh, reconstitute their own immune system, then the levels start to drop. Here you can see a clinical response in patient number two, and the left shows the, the um, tumor prior to infusion, and the right shows uh, the, the tumor after six weeks after infusion at the first time point. And this tumor response was accompanied by an increase in the frequency of HPV-specific T cells in peripheral blood, as well as an increase in the frequency of endogenous survivin-specific T cells. And this epitope spreading, we think, is very important to maintain, uh, to maintain anti-tumor activity in patients and to broaden the anti-tumor activity. And this was patient number five who actually achieved a complete tumor response. And you can see the, the, um, the tumor on the left prior to T-cell infusion and the complete response at the six-week time point. So overall in the outcomes, uh, three patients had stable disease. One of the two patients who received lymphodepleting chemotherapy has an ongoing complete tumor response. 
And patients seven and eight are, are too early to tell yet, because we've, they've recently been treated. There was no cytokine release syndrome, and this is something that we consistently see with virus-specific T cells, and only transient um, uh, uh, neutropenia, nausea, and alopecia. And this is probably related to the chemotherapy. So in conclusion, adoptive transfer of TGF-beta resistant HPV-specific T cells is feasible and safe. The expansion and persistence of the cells is clearly improved by lymphodepleting chemotherapy, as expected. However, the anti-tumor activity, although modest, is encouraging and at least tells us that tumors can tra traffic, that the T cells can traffic to the tumor sites and produce uh, anti-tumor responses. So on this trial, patient enrollment is, is continuing, but we are planning um, an enhanced protocol to try to improve upon these effects. And first of all, we have put a lot of effort into improving the manufacturing of the HPV-specific T cells so that we can now get higher frequencies of T cells specific for, H for the E6 and E7 antigens of HPV 16 and 18. And this results in fewer manufacturing failures because we were unable to make an HPV specific T cell product in uh, two thirds of the patients who were actually enrolled on the clinical trial for the first procurement. And we would like to include our constitutively active IL-7 receptor which we recently published in Cancer Discovery. And so the graphs at the bottom on the left just show that just by modifying our dendritic cell manufacture, we can increase the frequency of the HPV-specific T cells. And on the right, you can see that uh, removing inhibitory cell subsets can also increase the frequency. And, and this is just showing the frequency of the HPV-specific T cells on day nine of culture after a single uh, antigen stimulation. And just to, to discuss a little bit about the constitutively active IL-7 receptor that we plan to use, I'm just showing here the proliferation, persistence, and anti-tumor activity of T, of CAR, of T cells modified with a GD2 CAR for the treatment of, uh, of a metastatic neuroblastoma in a metastatic model. And on the left, you can see uh, graphs in which the T cells are labeled with, with uh, firefly luciferase, and on the left panel, you can see mice that have received one times 10 to the six CAR T cells. This is very low dose, and we see very little um, expansion of the CAR T cells. Whereas on the right, the, the CAR T cells are also expressing a constitutive active IL-7 receptor. And you can see that there is much greater expansion uh, of the CAR T cells, resulting in complete tumor responses in the majority of mice. So, um, I'd like to acknowledge the many people who have been involved in this clinical trial, um, uh, and, and there are many, probably many more than are listed here, but I'd particularly like to thank uh, Adrian G, who's the director of our GMP facility, Huey Min Zhang and her team who, who manufacture all the T cells, uh, Carlos's uh, lab, Niharika Narala and Gayatri Vyas, who did, did a lot of the development of the HPV-specific T cells, and Alex Salia, Pei Yuan Tao, and um, Sandy Sharma, who are doing the optimization studies. Thank you very much. Um, if people can make their way up to the microphones. Um, so what, one question that you touched on was the epitope spreading that you saw in one of the patients treated. What do you think the mechanism is for that epitope spreading? So we think what happens is that the HPV-specific T cells travel to the tumor site where they get activated by the E6 and E7 antigens expressed on the tumor and secrete cytokines. And activate T cells on, on um, encounter with antigens secrete gamma interferon, GMCSF, TNF-alpha, MIP1-alpha. And all of these cytokines can uh, reactivate an immunosuppressive tumor microenvironment, so we activate and recruit dendritic cells, which might then cross-present the antigens that, uh, uh, from the tumor cells that have been killed by the T cells. So we think it, it creates a sort of cascade of immunogenicity within um, a tumor microenvironment and partially reverses it. And we see this um, quite routinely in patients who receive virus-specific T cells, and not just for surviving, but for many other non-viral tumor antigens. Nice talk, thank you. Um, it, it, so did you, you didn't really talk much about the uh, expression level of the dominant negative um, transduction, or uh, talk about the transduction of the dominant negative 
uh, receptor and, and what that looked like in the T cells prior to going into the patients and whether you were able to actually look at that afterwards. Um, and so the, the expression of the, dom the, the dominant negative TGF beta receptor uh, is, very, is expressed in a retroviral vector and we see um, usually around 80% of the cells express the dominant negative receptor at the time of infusion. And with, with copy numbers, uh, on average, probably about uh, between one and, and four copies per cell. And we're tracking the cells both by tracking the, the, the dominant negative receptor in peripheral blood as well as the um, HPV-specific T cell activity afterwards. So, so that's been very helpful. But we can't really say whether the, how helpful the dominant negative receptor has been in improving the survival of the T cells. Um, we've used it in EBV-positive lymphoma, and we have found that patients who received EB, unmodified EBV-specific T cells, where the patients had a compartial response and then received the same T cells modified with the dominant negative receptor, have then gone on to produce a, a complete response. But I, I do think that, um, obviously, TGF-beta is not the only immunosuppressive component of the tumor microenvironment. And so other... Um, other means to try to improve the survival and expansion of T cells in the microenvironment I'm sure will be uh, important.